Nobody cares about making movies about people anymore. All they care about is zombie takeout. What's up? Welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some listeners see- listener submitted from Bodo. Um, in reference to our last episode, our review of From Beyond, I mentioned during the episode that um, Stuart Gordon and Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton had collaborated on a couple of other uh, Lovecraft-inspired movies, one of them being Castle Freaks. And in reference to that, Bodo said, I took the bullet for watching Castle Freaks. Slow, incest-laden. Did I mention slow? Oh, by the way, slow, slow, predictable. Did I mention slow? But not that bad. (laughs) So, yeah, thanks, Bodo. I think we'll skip that one. Particularly for the incest part. The incest. Hmm. Alrighty. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not so much worried about the slow, because, you know, people have different ideas about slow and, you know, how well well it may work. The incest part, I think I want to shy away from. Weird. And without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1986, FX. This is our Brian Dennehy tribute. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu spot summary, sponsored by the 80s. It doesn't seem like that long ago. Yeah, we called that home for 10 years, didn't yeah, we? we? Did. Uh, <laughs> and also brought to you by Tidy Whiteys. Put some fucking pants on. Although, in my defense, the 80s that I lived in was more of the neon geometric, you know, <laughs> Nylon eighties. Hmm. Mine and was then, more and of and then the spandex hair, you know, hair metal eighties. But mine was more of a wood panel. Uh... Oh, okay. The the, the kind of still seventies eighties. <laughs> yes. Long into the almost into the nineties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, so the impromptu plot summary: We have a special effects guy um, who loves his work and. Uh, Seems to have many talents. <laughs> um, <laughs> he um, he gets offered a job to stage an assassination, and uh, honestly, I, I thought the whole thing was absurd until at the end or after the movie. Uh, I actually saw something where this is kind of based on <laughs> some factual information. Really, according to what the what FX guy said, yes, he'd been hired by the government repeatedly oh, wow. to stage different things. I'm like, okay. Maybe not in the U.S., but maybe abroad. Mm-hmm. Maybe in the U.S., he didn't say. Uh, but for it to make sense, it, it had to be apparent what he was hired for, of course. Right. Um, he's hired to stage job. To the assassination of the guy from Law and Order. Right, to... to oh. He's and, always the guy from Law Order to me. Yeah, I can't remember the name of, of the cop who plays in Law Order. Briscoe. Oh, Briscoe. Yeah, okay. Yes. I yeah, I just not enough sleep lately. Mm-hmm. But anyway, <laughs> he gets hired to stage the assassination of Briscoe and Jerry uh, Robach playing a mob boss. Yeah, I, I know, pretty much the gang that couldn't shoot straight guy is now uh, thirteen years older. Mm-hmm. So he's been running the mob for 13 years <laughs> and he's worked a deal out now to uh, to to not only get him in witness protection, but to uh, run off with some money. Uh, of course, that's revealed later, but it, no, no shit. That's what's going on here. <laughs> the so it goes off pretty much as planned, except they make it make the. Uh, the effects guy believed that maybe he actually killed him because they were kind of messing about with the gun before the, the job went down. And they attempted to kill the effects guy right after the staged assassination. Right. He's really not the smartest guy in the world. <laughs> what, what's with this plastic down here? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. And then calling the other guy, the, the guy higher up, Hey, your your underling tried to kill me. Yeah. Oh. The guy who works with blood packets and squibs says what's with the plastic. 
Right. And uh, so he tries to kill him too. <laughs> and then he finally gets it that he's been screwed over. And he, um, so of course, to his effects box or bag or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, he comes up with different ways to avoid the authorities and uh, avoid the uh, the killers. And uh, gets his girlfriend killed, r- ropes in his innocent assistant, risks her life for a while. Right. He gets his girlfriend killed. And then I don't know why he thought they, they wouldn't, that wouldn't be the first place that they would go to look for him. Um, it's not like the guy who actually initially tried to kill him was at his apartment the day before. Right. So he, they knew plenty about him. And, uh, and finally, like ridiculously late into the movie, you get Brian Dennehy. <laughs> not halfway through, I checked. Not yeah, quite halfway. Is. It is. It's half. It's about halfway through that you find out that they're the cop who put this mob boss away and was pissed about this whole thing getting fucked up. Uh, smells a rat. Uh, checks out the murder or checks out the effects guy's apartment. Uh, makes a really super fantastic deduction that I'm kind of on the fence of. Is that could he really have figured that out or not? <laughs> Uh, so there was a certain pattern of bullets on the uh, on the the mob boss. He sees that certain pattern on the dummy in the effects guy's apartment, and puts two and two together, or I don't know, some other variables together, mm-hmm. and comes up with four that these are um, that maybe he did this on his. Actually, first he okay. First he thinks the effects guy might have really went off and did it for real, but you know it's still mm-hmm. that that was his first theory. So maybe, but then why would you need to test out that precise right. pattern? Yeah. You know, it's like look, look at that. <laughs> so, um, he winds up getting kicked off the force because he um, he flies by the uh, seat of his pants a mm-hmm. little bit too much. Um, and uh, they had to cram one more cliche. Yeah, he didn't get yelled at by his by the lieutenant, which is which was a little refreshing. <laughs> but again, that was a cliche by this time. That was yeah. like a known. I mean, this is around the same time that the show Sledgehammer was yeah. on, and they had the you know the lieutenant that with always the veins popping mm-hmm. out, you know, making fun of that cliche. Uh, and of course, our effects guy. Uh, Raleigh, he um, he plots a revenge using effects to break into the D- Department of Justice's house, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hilarity ensues. And I know it sounds like we once again picked a bad movie for a tribute episode, but <clears throat> Denny he makes this thing watchable. What a brain Jesus for me. Christ. If if he, you know what, I'd recommend this movie if Denny he were in this maybe yeah. t- fifteen to twenty minutes sooner. Right. I'm gonna start off with some trivia though. Um, the unsolicited screenplay was written by two novice writers, actor Gregory Fleeman and documenter- documentarian Robert T. Magnuson. Producer Jack uh, Jack Weiner read their script. Which Weiner uh, probably read their script, which was submitted as a low budget TV movie and felt that it should be made into a theatrical release. Weiner and his co producer Dodi Fayed hired Robert Mandel, an off Broadway director. They did not want to hire an action director, but instead wanted a director who would bring a realistic touch to the film and make the audience care about the main character. Mandel accepted the job because he wanted to dispel the perception that he was a soft, arty director. Initially, he was not impressed with the film's screenplay, which he felt was not well-crafted, but felt that it provided a lot of action and a lot of things that I did not have under my belt. In preparation for the film's action sequences, Mandel studied the car chases from Bullet and the French Connection to pull off the film's special effects. The producers hired John Steers, who had worked on the eight bond uh, uh, on the first eight bond films and shared special effects the special effects academy award for a new hope so everything but that last part was a comedy of errors 
Right. I, I mean, this could have been, if, if this had been directed by, in the hands of someone that knew what they were doing, th- mm-hmm. this could have also worked as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, better writers, better mostly cast, then he aside. Um, I feel the writers could have, they, they a director could have smoothed over a lot of the stuff the writers fair point, fair point. had neglected. I think yeah. the writers gave us enough to go with, actually. But I, I just think the directing was just... Mm-hmm. But, okay. Some of the... An unsolicited script from two novices didn't think it was worth it, but decided to give it a shot anyway, brought in an off-Broadway director. Yeah, <sighs> that's... Why Why would they do that? Is and the really director the... saying, well, it's not that good, but there's lots of action and I want to change my image, so I'll do it. And But then you expect to have like some really solid performances. And other than Dennehy, who you, you know. get the feeling can direct himself pretty yeah, much. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, mean, Dennehy's always the same guy, <laughs> but he really grounds anything he does. Like He can do something incredibly ridiculous, but just his presence will ground it. Well, I felt, I mean, he was completely different in this than the guy in, um, in Silverado, who is, you know, yeah, bit of a, you know, <laughs> bit of the scoundrel, you know, well, this he, guy is just more of a single minded, you know, <laughs> but his, his character, character, his persona, he's always just kind of that grounded, no nonsense guy. You know, true. He is always of the earth. Yeah, um, that that's just who Denny he was as a performer. Um, I got to see him perform live a few times, uh, and and one of them was uh, Desire Under the Elms, which is just a monster of a play by O'Neill, mm-hmm. and he was just this <laughs> angry, crotchety old guy. <laughs> but he's not one of those actors who completely transforms each time. You know, no. he's still very similar. It's um, still but, him, and but, it, but, yeah. but it's amazing how he did it. You know, it's yeah, still and, him. And he his performances are always completely believable, and he always brings a touch of realism. He's done some really absurd things, but he brings some realism to it. Um, now, all the stories of people who've met him, and, and I met him briefly, too, mm-hmm. He seems like the nicest guy mm-hmm. in the world. <laughs> like, just like, hey, slugger, you know. <laughs> well, he, he kind of always frequently played hard asses yeah and people who play those kind of characters because they get it out of their system at work tend to be nice it seems you know people who play villains and hard asses and you know asshole characters tend to be nicer people it it just seems to be the case like uh kurtwood smith always plays an asshole apparently he's like the nicest person in the world the guy from that 70s show red Oh, right, right. The the president of the Federation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> getting back to the movie. Um, it has this long opening credit sequence, which is really quaint right now. But, you know, yeah. now it seems really quaint. And, I mean, right away, I'm like, I don't remember this movie meriting such a dramatic <laughs> intro musically. And, and even after the movie, I was like, I, I was right, because... The, the two really don't go together. It's a very lighthearted movie in a way. I do like the opening theme, though. And you mentioned that you don't remember it. I had never seen the movie before. And this is one that I'd always wondered about. like Because I remember when it came out in the 80s, and the idea of a special effects artist in a, this murder movie intrigued me. Sorry if I hit the mic there. Um, I think and... I remember the sequel more than this. Oh, I think. I think the sequel was much more of a buddy cop movie, which uh-huh. is kind of what I was expecting here. And because it's kind of built that way that the two of them are working together mm-hmm. to solve a crime kind of thing, but they're working separately. Yeah. And the series apparently is that, yes, this got a series more on all of that in sequels and remakes. Yeah. But I was always kind of intrigued by the concept of this movie. And I always kind of w- w- thought about watching it. Um, I, I was not surprised it was this bad after watching the trailer. <laughs> um, but like I said, then he makes it better. Um, I will say I did like in the opening, I did like how the city skyline kind of faded in from a drawing. And then yeah. it starts off with this movie within a movie, a shooting in a restaurant, which right. is nicely mirrored later. Um, the pyro in it was just ridiculous. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you kind of you knew it was a movie, of course. Mm. I mean, it, it was very a lot of it was very predictable, but it had to be predictable because what else would explain what's going on, right. kind of thing. You know, waiters walking by with something flambéed, you know, something on fire on a on a platter, and it knocks <laughs> over onto a guy, and the guy get catches on fire completely. The fish shot the hit the the. the the hitman shot the fish. Yeah. Um, and then you know we, we they cut the movie, of course, and we get the effects artist. And the small talk at the beginning of the movie was not sold at all. Yeah, the a lot of the supporting cast, well, Brian Brown and the supporting cast. Yeah, yeah. Are How did he have a career after this but or before really, this? He really didn't, though. I mean, he did cocktail. And then he did the sequel to this. No, I, I checked. And that he's was pretty much it. No, he's been working consistently since then. Mostly That's in Australia, true. I think. Yeah. Because I, I had to check IMDb to see if he had done anything else. He's been working consistently. Um, I, maybe this was. Maybe he just phoned it in on this one. Maybe he's actually a much better actor. I, I don't know. I haven't seen him in anything else. I haven't seen Cocktail. I, I generally avoid Tom Cruise movies. I think I did see that one back in the day. I think everybody, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> something about some of those movies or Tom Cruise of that era where everybody had to go and see a Tom Cruise movie. I avoided them. I still haven't seen uh, even Top Gun. Well, well, yeah, that was mandatory viewing for us in the eighth grade. I mean, that was <laughs> everybody had to take their call name kind of who was Goose and who was Iceman and all that nonsense. I don't know. Maybe it skipped my area. Maybe it's an age thing. I mean, only I'm only a year and a half older than you. Yeah, if you've seen us drink that in. Um, <laughs> but still, I, it didn't seem that necessary to me. And it's Cruz. I, I saw him in like I think I saw like a clip of Risky Business and was like, no, I'm not interested in this guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, the small talk at the beginning was horrible. Um, even when they brought in the 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 cop who was or the the Justice Department guy who was trying to pull him in. He was even kind of pathetic. So you understand the the novice director for action mm-hmm. movies, at yeah. least, not doing action well. Why he but can't, what's why the can, excuse for not doing acting? And yeah, why can't he do well? dialogue when he's an, well, he's an off-Broadway guy? Uh, yeah, but still, you know, there's no excuse. You know, the mm. some of the, the bit players, the supporting roles of this were just really bad <laughs> i did appreciate the girlfriend when she you know as long as she was in the movie because you know she's an the she's an actress in the movie he's working on and she really played the part of an actress yeah you know if you've ever you know knew any theater people in college or high school <laughs> she was an actress you know um I hadn't and, thought of that, but yeah, yeah, she was. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I, is she Natalie Portman's mom or something? By the is way, I, I did don't not know. Notice that? Did she, didn't she look exactly? Like oh yeah, there was a resemblance a bit. Yeah, um, I and it sounds like Raleigh makes our kind of movies. Too bad they're not real. <laughs> well, I just remember Mama was real. It was. Yes, it was. I, I need to I need to see that. I, um, I, we we passed by that in the video store many a time, and we, we kind of well, chuckle at the title because, of course, I mean, I, especially after being a drama student, uh-huh. knowing that there's an "I Remember Mama," that's what the, the title is the play on that. Right? Yeah, yeah. I need to find that. Then we should, we need to review that. Yes, um, that is a real movie. And I don't of know course, about the others though, but I imagine they are. Mm-hmm. And of course, I was pulled right back into the '80s when they wanted to um, bring him in to help with someone who was going into the re- witness relocation program. That was a huge trope back then. <laughs> well, like, I mean, they were acting like they'd never heard of it though by then, and, mm-hmm. and I was kind of like, "Really?" I'm trying to think <laughs> of what what you know what kind of stuff had been out by then. Yeah, this was '86, uh, and I think that trope goes back to like '83. It really maybe 84 um and it's kind of interesting i think this was an era when people were really kind of into what effects artists do yeah it's kind of like right before this you had the fall guy when people were kind of all into what stunt people do that's so they had you know the stunt guy who was a bounty hunter now they have you know the effects artist who was framed for murder 
you know, the, the, the you know the Justice Department after him. A Mr. Wizard by chance. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, I do like that he had to be talked into it. He just didn't just jump, you know, when they offered him the deal. But so easily manipulated. Oh, yeah. we're going to get this other guy to do it. Right. <laughs> like, uh, I really, he's really going to just fall for that. So, yeah, they make him really stupid. Mm -hmm. And in the decade we've been doing this show, we've talked about Planet 70s quite a bit. We have not talked much about Planet 80s. When did Planet 80s become a thing? Uh, This was like an episode of Stranger Things, wasn't it? (laughs) Well, that's true, but that's real early 80s. That's almost 70s. Ah, Yeah. They're moved, they moved, they're into 84 in the last season, so... Yeah, but, like, the first season was 83, 82, which yeah, is like kind of transitional. This is 86. <laughs> this should not feel like another planet. Ah, uh, but it is. Eighth grade. <laughs> well, and then I realized it was 34 fucking years ago. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> and I, I was pleasantly surprised because it looked like they were setting up this random sex scene like right after he does you know when he comes back after they offer him the deal after he takes the deal yeah he looks like they were setting up a random sex scene between the fx artist and the girlfriend they spared us it he just they kind of just cut to right afterward when he's pondering the deal and he calls his assistant so how was this rated r benny by chance what what merited the r rating I didn't realize it was rated R. I can't think of anything. Um, there's no nudity. There's right. not a lot of violence. Right. And the violence in there is really cartoonish. Yes. Um, there's not even a lot of profanity. No. It was very weird. The MPAA works in mysterious ways. Mm-hmm. Having him tie his assistant's legs while she's asleep when he you know, went to pick up the box was weird. <sighs> Yes. They were setting up this like t- practical joke war between them. She, you know, um trips a box and she hands him the next day with like white powder. Um and it was just those two pranks and that was it. Yeah. It didn't become a thing. Um so it just seemed weird and unnecessary. And the um, assistant had to have been the worst actor in this film. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was like... the one doing most of the small talk in the beginning, too. Right. Right, she was just painful to watch. Yeah. And, okay, so right after he, you know, the way he escapes after they try to kill him, after he fakes the murder, um, he kills one of the guys, you know, they're wrestling with a gun, the driver of the car gets killed. The car drives into a, a fence, kind of hovers over, you know, kind of teeters over this precipice. He gets out onto a sidewalk, and this homeless guy starts yelling about how, you know, there's no parking after 10. That would have been funny in the 80s. Yeah. The homeless guy. New York parking laws and homeless guys enforcing them. And also, this was back when, you know, a movie could get away with saying the Justice Department were murderers. (laughs) I thought the guy, uh, Lipton, was from the the one from Son of a Beach, but no, he was. He did look familiar. I couldn't place him, though. Uh, He done bit parts here okay. and there in fact, so I'm uh, a bunch of stuff don't really know the, the other guy that they sent after him you know had done a number of bit parts to mm. usually a hitman okay <laughs> the one that was in the in the pond right 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 and then mercifully then he shows up finally <laughs> he's the only one who made an effort except the girlfriend I mean she made an effort in a, in a very over the top kind of way but then he's really the only one who was really acting. I mean, he was a cop. There was <laughs> no like, questioning about it. There was no like, oh, do you really believe this guy could be a cop? No. He, I was like the mustache and just the, yeah. the demeanor and everything. Like, uh, I knew fucking cops like this. <laughs> <laughs> and although there's one scene that, again, really dates the movie. Um, this other cop is helping him with, who, you know, works in the, the computer section of the department, is helping him get some information. And he kisses her after she, like, breaks up some <laughs> information for him, find, you know, find something for him. If that was today, he'd have been fired in a heartbeat. 
they do put their re- relationship as quite ambiguous, don't they? Well, I mean, if they had established that they're a couple, then that's fine. But that would have played better. But like, you get a feeling that they're kind of a coworkers with benefits sort perhaps, of thing. Perhaps, just uh, just from the the way they re- interact with each mm-hmm. other. That dated the movie, and just his character's sort of casual sexism really dates oh, yeah. it. A cop. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Although the scene when Tyler calls in when he's in the building, you know, the call is coming from inside the building. Yes, they played that chestnut, too. <laughs> I can't believe they did that, too. Um, the, um, Lipton is using one of those shoulder rests on his handset. I have not seen one of those in ages. Well, right. I mean, I, I probably sometime in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, um, Raleigh's in disguise because that's what he does. Looks like Gimli from Lord of the Rings. I mean, does it does effects guys really like? They're not into costuming. <laughs> That's true. He's not an effects makeup artist. Right. He's the guy who works the squibs and the explosions and all yes. of that. So yeah, he also apparently does effects makeup and um, stunt driving. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I gotta give it credit. An '80s movie pointing out that a computer can't do something when then he asks for a split screen. That was nice. That bought this movie a brain, honestly. The <laughs> fact that they they used computers realistically. Like, <laughs> and they knew what they were talking about when they had computers. But, you know, this is the age of... Well, this is actually a little bit before Enhance. So I was pleasantly surprised by that. Um, although... Um, oh, yeah. You know, like, it's some picture that... Enhance. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have to wonder why they made Tyler think he killed DeFranco if they didn't really want him dead. If they were trying to knock him off, you get you have the effects guy do it, you frame him, that's great. That makes sense. They didn't actually want him dead. They were going to run away with him and get the money. But why make Tyler think he killed him? Uh, hmm. I think they may have been hedging their bets. I, I don't Maybe. know. I don't know if they really went all through all that much to, to convince him that he killed him. I think they were just, you know, making sure that nothing went off without a hitch there. I think he was just checking to make sure there really were blanks in there and that uh, Raleigh wasn't uh, double-crossing mm-hmm. them. Right, right. But, uh, of course, this is something they couldn't do in a present-day movie because Internet geeks would recognize an effects guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. Um. And I have to say, at least Raleigh grew a conscience and dumped his assistant, like, let her go, you know. Yeah. You know, and she protested. You'd, you'd th- she was all into it by that point, but he, but he um, had her get out of the van and drove away. Yeah. It's just... And mercifully to the audience, too. Yeah, yeah true. Um, it's just too bad Misty never got... Misty, Misty 3K never got a hold of this one. Because yeah. I would love to see the Misty this. I mean, obviously, they needed to get together earlier in, you know, in mm-hmm. the movie instead of her. <laughs> right. Um, also, I noticed when they, th- you know, when you think they've killed Raleigh, he's holding a gun. He's laying on his back holding this uh, rifle when he's supposedly dead. <laughs> like, he's clutching it. Yeah. Yeah. And and then DeFranco's death scene was just comically bad. And it's Urbach. He's a good actor. Yeah. But he can't do a death scene. <laughs> I don't think he ever had to do one. Probably not. And, okay, so where did the head of the Justice Department live? Was he still in, the New, York, in New York City? I think he was upstate. Upstate. Because I think that the, was the thing with the, the state troopers. Okay, because I was just going there. Because they suddenly turned into Mounties. Right. So they're more upstate. They're kind of like, well, we don't have a helicopter. (laughs) But they had the hats and the coats and they they really looked like Mounties. I think there's, we've skipped over somebody though. Um, Okay. uh, Of course, the cop Murdoch, the rival cop. Oh, yeah. Did Did you recognize him? Again, looked familiar. Couldn't place him. Well, that guy I didn't have to look up. That, that of course was Nathan, Arizona. Oh, Okay. Right. This is a shakedown. <laughs> Guy dresses like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then the scene where uh, Dennehy is coming to get information on the Department of Justice guy head uh, to get his address for him, when he just opens that door and that glare he gives him, <laughs> yeah, it's just I I would like to. I mean, that should be a meme <laughs> in <laughs> itself, just for you, like you're gonna fuck someone up. <laughs> this is a reaction gif of that. Yes. Just get that Dennehy with the mustache mm. staring through the door, just like, <laughs> <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I did think that Raleigh faking his death with prosthetics over his pulse points was a nice touch. Yes. That was clever. Mm-hmm. How an effects guy would come up with that, I don't know, but hey. <laughs> and then, of course, um, he, him and Dennehy run away to the Alps and you know get the money and... <laughs> Strangers in the Alps. Gotta reference the title. If you don't get the title of this episode, um, watch This is the what t- happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. Watch the TV edit of The Big Lebowski. <laughs> now, you and mentioned then, that this was possibly based on real life events. Yes. <laughs> there, there, there is an effects guy out there saying that, yeah, he, he'd been hired to stage. Okay. Things. Because it also. <laughs> Um, bears a resemblance to Three Days of the Condor, apparently. I, I, if I've seen that, it's been too long. But that Oh, bizarre. wow. Yeah, I haven't seen that in probably decades. Mm. It was also the film debut of Angela Bassett. Wait, That's, what? Uh, Angela Bassett made her debut in this movie as a TV in reporter. In this movie? Yeah. I didn't notice her oh, either. She played a TV reporter. I can't remember TV reporter in the movie. Oh, right. just somebody on TV, probably yeah. in the background. It was a bit part, but yeah, it was oh, okay. Angela Bassett's film debut. That's really cool. Yeah. On a sequel remix? Or... I mean, the, the criminality of this whole movie mm. is the fact that Brian Brown and Brian Dennehy, did you count how much stage time or screen time they held, they shared together? Like 10 minutes? <laughs> Maybe. I got if if it was two minutes. Yeah, probably you're. Yeah, you're being generous. Probably. I yeah. mean, if you're counting like the them being strangers in the Alps, right? You're probably talking maybe three or four right. tops. Yes. Yeah. But for a movie where they kind of are billed together, yeah, right? <laughs> it's like, what the fuck were they thinking? <laughs> and that that leads nicely into strain, uh, sequels and remakes. Um. A sequel, FX2, The Deadly Art of Illusion, <laughs> was released in 91. Yeah, that is very 91 for a title. And a spin-off <laughs> TV series entitled FX The Series was produced from 96 to 98. Now, if they could have just gotten the Coens to have directed this, mm-hmm. god damn. <laughs> yeah. Despite the studio's financial troubles... MGM announced in 2010 that it planned a remake of X- FX with Robert Mandel directing again. Why? The new movie was originally slated to be released in 2011. Let's hope that stays in development hell. Were, were they going to bring back Dennehy at that time? or I mean, that would have Was that the plan? Um, he could have pulled off the role. I don't know if Brian Brown would have worked <laughs> in that part. So the sequel, like Denny, he's just, you know, a private eye or whatever instead. And it's kind of what you thought this movie was going to be. The two of them, you know, work together to solve. I mean, it's, but it's a great idea for a buddy cop movie. Did you, you know? see the sequel? Cause you mentioned the sequel earlier. I probably did. Maybe you don't remember in the theater 20, okay. uh, what, what we almost 30 years ago <laughs> from what i was reading about the series that is what the series is yeah they they I solve know. crimes together completely recast it's not dennehy and brown oh yeah yeah the series yeah they're not going to do tv they're not going to do syndicated tv in the mid 90s mid to late 90s i was gonna say dennehy probably did a lot of tv still um well, sure, he did a lot of guest appearances but he's not yeah. going to be a regular on a syndicated show you know one of those shows that went right into syndication he was like a not a not a regular, but a, a occasional on the blacklist. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's done a lot of other TV stuff. Which I but never was... did see how that ended, actually, because <laughs> my DVR went kaplunk uh-huh. or gone. <laughs> uh-huh. 
On the brains. On the brains. I'm going three. Um, like I said, then he gave it a brain. Um, and the rest of it was, eh. Yeah. <laughs> it's fresh. It's frustrating because they could have had, they could have had a really good movie here, mm-hmm. except, ah, uh, man, the dialogue is just painful to get through. And, uh, you know, it, it's really weird because the action scenes are good. Yeah. There's like a, a weird cameo, too, by the World Trade Center in the scene where he's stealing mm-hmm. his truck back, by the way. And it's a good to... concept. And yeah, it's a great concept for a buddy cop movie, except uh, the buddies aren't together. Mm-hmm. This is like a weird prequel. Apparently that's the, se- <laughs> the series and maybe the sequel. <laughs> It's a prequel to something yeah. that didn't happen, <laughs> but it's kind of like this origin story of how these two got together. And well, uh, again, maybe in the sequel, you don't remember it, and I don't nothing about it. And the, apparently, the sequel, that was the premise of the series. Yeah, the sequel I think I enjoyed more mm. if I can remember back thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm right there with you. Three brains. This is the second time in since we've come back from the break that we've agreed in the middle. We never agree in the middle. <laughs> Ah, the, I think these were, you know, pretty, pretty good calls, though. Yeah, yeah, I'm not <laughs> disagreeing with either of our reviews. I'm just, it's yeah. weird. We agree at the ends of the spectrum, never in the middle. Um, yeah. So what have we learned? Uh, when someone when someone tries to kill you twice, you're, you're not paranoid. <laughs> and I learned <laughs> that I have no idea why they based the series on this movie, movie and how the hell it lasted for two years. I'm tempted to watch a couple of episodes. The premise is strong, I think. It's just this Hmm. was not executed well. (laughs) Maybe the series has better execution, hopefully. All right, so until next time, when we will possibly, hopefully, (laughs) finally be reviewing Heavy Metal 2000. Oh, man. Our Julie Strange tribute. Um, Not that it's a particularly good movie. I don't think it's probably any better than this. But it would be nice to get to it. They they say Denny he you know the one role he wanted to play never got to was King Lear but oh that would have been brilliant after seeing this I think the role he really should have played was Sherlock Holmes ooh because it was I mean his character you kind of got a, a Sherlock Holmes feel from him in this yeah. and you know. he made some really wild deduction you know leaps in logic and. Dennehy and and, as Holmes would have like been at, a first was, at first I was kind of like, could he really have gotten that the mm. fact that he was still alive just from that, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and the and of course the the gun pattern, you right. know, Dennehy but, as Holmes would have been a complete twist on the character too. Yeah, because like the the you know Bandersnatch or, or Cumberbatch, that's Cumberbatch. It. <laughs> Actually, that, I knew it wasn't Bandersnatch, but it was the closest I could get. I wasn't make, yes. intentionally making a joke there. Um, <laughs> but but his take on the character was very traditional. He's very kind of upper crusty and stuffy yeah. kind of character. Yeah. Um, Watson is the kind of, you know, the nor- the, the mensch, the, 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 the normal guy. Right. Um, then he, as Holmes, would have been brilliant. I think, um, it, I think we really missed out. Yeah. But anyway, until uh, we hopefully finally review Heavy Metal, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.